Good morning, everyone. If you could go ahead and take your seats. Welcome back. Day two of the 2022 Mental Health Summit. I truly hope that yesterday had an impact on you. I hope that you have a lot of discussions, a lot of questions. I was impressed with how many people stayed and participated in filling out the delegation sheets last night. I said it yesterday morning and I'll say it again, this is designed to be a catalyst and not a conclusion. And I'm really excited how yesterday went. I'm equally as excited for today. So thank you for being back here, both in, in person and online to our Zoom viewers. Welcome to day two. So to open day two, um, we have a special guest speaker this morning. And you, you know he's the voice. You know that he's the broadcaster for the Kansas City Royals. You know a lot of things about Ryan Lefevre. You know uh, what it's like to watch a game and hear him tell us that Carlos Beltran really is a five-tool player. He's able to describe when the rookie phenom named Zach Greinke is going to make his debut. He, he lets us know because we weren't quite sure that it was, in fact, fair when the ball came off Salvi's bat in the bottom of the 12th in the ALCS wildcard game in 2014. All of these, all of these memories that we have about watching Royals games, we also have Ryan Lefevre's voice in the backdrop of that. These are things that we know. There's also some other things that you might know about Ryan, that he was an all Big Ten baseball player for the University of Minnesota, that he's been broadcasting for the Royals since 1999. I will also tell you that in 2014, he was named one of the 25 most influential Kansans, even though he lives and works in Missouri. So uh, these are things that you, you may know about Ryan Lefevre. That's the voice that you hear when you follow Royals. One of the things that you may not know about Ryan Lefevre is that he is a father, husband, and philanthropist in the Kansas City area. That he has written a book about his experience and his journey through mental health. That he is an advocate that he partnered with the Royals last year for the Shut Out the Stigma campaign, addressing behavioral health and mental health issues nationally with his platform. So when you hear his voice, I hope that after today, and you're gonna hear from Ryan in just a second, we've got, a, we've got an intro video and then Ryan's gonna come up on the stage. But I hope when you hear his voice after today, when you hear his voice in the future, when you get home tonight and you all have time to get home tonight for the 7:15 first pitch, Grinky and Casey Mize tonight, when you hear the Tigers game, when you hear his voice, it's my hope that after this morning, you'll hear his voice in a little different perspective. Is this a baseball town? Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the ballpark. My name is Ryan Lefevre. God gave me everything I wanted just to show me it wasn't what I needed. On the ground to Hosmer. Davis to the bag. Magic number zero. Royals are the 2015 American League Central Division champions. On the outside, life was more than I could have imagined. Swinging a ground ball to third is fair! Fair ball! On the inside, I was falling apart. I was suffering from major depressive disorder. No accomplishment or relationship was going to heal me. I needed help. Here's the 2-2 pitch. Swing and a high fly ball right field. Should be deep enough. Granderson gets behind it. He makes the catch. Escobar tags. Escobar to the plate. He is safe. And the Royals take game one. It was like taking game one first. One step at a time, one day at a time, healing one wound at a time. Royals. 
with the help of others and by the grace of God, I am here today. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege and honor to welcome to the stage, please join me, the Kansas City Royals broadcaster, Ryan Lefevre. Good morning. I hate to disappoint you, but I am not as cool as that video is. It's a bit overwhelming myself to watch it sometimes, and I have to think to myself, that was really edited well, because uh, I'm a lot more regular than that video would suggest. Um, Rob, thank you for this invitation and for putting this summit together. Um, I, am, I have written my speech for two reasons. Number one, the interest of time. And that number two, in my profession, if I have the chance to write down or know what I'm going to say ahead of time, I'm going to take advantage of it. Because that's not how it works at the ballpark. And I can humbly tell you that this is one of the greatest privileges of my professional career. And as, as I watch this video and I listen to those calls, you know, if you think about it, my job is just about commentating about the achievements of other people. That's all I'm doing. And everybody in this room would probably do a fine job of yelling and screaming into a microphone when their favorite player did something exciting or their team won the World Series. Um, and I know that my job has a lot to do with why I was invited here today. So I am excited to tell you about something that is mine and it's my story. I hope my story isn't too long and it's too boring, but I believe it will set the stage for my battle with depression and anxiety. And while I believe that mental health issues are rightly being treated as a medical condition and should be treated as such, there is more to recovery than medication and sympathy. And for many of us, it requires the same determination, humility, and accountability required to reconstruct our lives when we are diagnosed with other medical conditions like diabetes or Crohn's disease. And like with any other disease, I had been victimized by something that I never asked for in the first place. And I had to be accountable for how long I choose to label myself as a victim. I grew up in Los Angeles in the 70s and the 80s in a divorced, broken home in a broken city. My search for meaning and identity was filled with creating an image that fit the what do you do, who do you know, and what do you have? My father was a Major League Baseball player for the Dodgers, Jim Lefevre, Rookie of the Year, World Champion for his hometown team. My mom was a stewardess back when we called them a stewardess. Some people might remember that in the room. Later a model and very successful in the real estate business in Los Angeles, um, dealing with the rich and famous so that they could sell and buy from the rich and famous. So my parents, friends and associates became who I knew and living vicariously through them became what I had. The only thing left was what I was going to do. And the only option I had in my own mind was to set out to accomplish something that would allow me equal association with the ultra known and the ultra wealthy, because all of that looked ultra happy. I got to see them behind closed doors and with the cameras off, and I began to realize that the short-lived satisfaction of accomplishment for the approval of others didn't fill me up. It slowly hollowed me out. I began using alcohol at the age of 14 as a form of self-medication. And as I was filling up my body after years of alcohol abuse, I was also adding more pain upon myself and others. Now, meanwhile, I had turned a successful amateur baseball career into a professional broadcasting career. 
Baseball was going to provide me the fame and fortune I desired. I loved hearing the crowd roar for a player and long for that kind of attention someday. I didn't love myself, but I thought 35,000 strangers cheering me on in my job would fill the voids. Over time, my life became like a bathtub with a leaky faucet, like a slow drip into a large tub. My choices in life and those I associated with, mostly in commiseration, weren't noticeable until the tub filled up. Alcohol and success on the field and in the booth provided a temporary pulling of the plug to let the water drain, but the leak continued and got worse. Things really began to move fast in a good way professionally. I was given many big television and radio assignments in my mid-20s, and with that came the much-desired attention I desired to fill temporarily the emptiness on the inside. I could put on a pretty good mask when the red light went on, but I was falling deeper and deeper into a dark place away from the microphone. As a mentor once put it to me bluntly, your peers see you as a young man with a lot of talent, but very little character. Thankfully, after years of destructive behavior, I had my last drink on January 25th, 1998 as a 26-year-old following a fight on a college campus with a college kid. It was probably the most humiliating day of my life, and it nearly cost me my career. Now, on one hand, I was praised for taking control of my life and walking away from the most destructive vice in my life, albeit this was the third time I had quit drinking. The poor decisions caused by alcohol went away, but so did my medication. Instead of blowing off steam at bars, I was forced to see and feel all the damage I had done and how little I felt about myself. The tub continued to fill and it became harder to pull the plug for temporary relief. All of my focus was directed toward my career and the continuing saga, saga of seeking approval of mostly strangers. My culture, at least the way I saw it, told me a big lie. I accomplished everything I had set out to accomplish professionally and financially before I turned 30. It was about then that I could feel the water on my feet. The symbolic bathtub of my life had filled beyond capacity and it didn't matter if I could get to the plug or not. It was too late. My life was a mess. And like water flowing uncontrollably over the edges of an overfilled bathtub, my body began to do the same thing. And at the age of 34, I found myself lying in a fetal position in my closet, sobbing uncontrollably and crying out for the comfort of my mother. For several months, I somehow got through my job in life. When I was at the stadium, I did my best to get through a three hour baseball game, thinking constantly about getting back to my house or my hotel room so that I could cry. I couldn't eat and I couldn't sleep. My sorrow turned into fear of breaking down in public or even worse, at a stadium. Enter anxiety. For someone who almost always desired the company of others, suddenly I feared the company of others. The more the merrier became the more the scarier. I was afraid to leave my house. I was afraid to leave my hotel room. Suddenly hallways and restaurants seemed to close in on me and I became claustrophobic. Next up, panic attacks. Out of nowhere during the day and predictably at night, my heart would begin to pound as if it was going to explode. I would sweat profusely and it was difficult to breathe slowly, but there was nothing wrong with my life. My body's reaction to some sort of sorrow or anger did not reflect my life circumstances. I began counseling, and after weeks of processing why I became so afraid in life and peeling back the layers for answers, we landed at the beginning. At the age of four, 
I became aware of the effects of being emotionally detached from my parents. I had suffered through the arguments, the ugly words they hurled at each other in person and over the phone, and I lived with this for 30 years. Armed with this information and recognizing that much of my struggles with identity, purpose, and alcohol, I began to feel some relief, but now I needed accountability and help with a plan to avoid pitfalls and blind spots that could easily throw me back into another dark place. During this training, a very poignant question was presented to me. Is Ryan enough? As I began to truly realize my pursuit of notoriety, it was really a desire to be loved for who I was and not for what I did. I had to figure out if Ryan was enough. If I continued to live my life the way I had lived for the past 30 years with the bad decisions and bad outcomes, that was on me. I was an adult making adult decisions. My parents were off the hook. Again, if I wanted to live my life justifying my bad decisions by being a victim, that was my decision. I was on two medications, Xanax for anxiety and Lexapro for my depression. But the best medical advice I received was from my best friend, Eric. In the human pharmaceutical industry at the time, Eric explained to me how different hormones work in a healthy, balanced brain, what goes wrong in an unhealthy brain, and what the medic medication is designed to do. And then the words I will never forget. In his opinion, quote, these drugs are designed to help you, but you should be always thinking about when you are going to wean yourself off of these drugs. They are not designed to be a lifelong remedy. I didn't fully understand what he meant at the time, but I took his advice and I was on Lexapro for three and a half years. I call it my triangle of recovery, medication to balance a possible chemical imbalance in my brain and help me control my emotions, counseling to discover what previous life circumstances were triggering my present life circumstances, and accountability to come up with a new plan for my life and somehow to coach me and walk alongside me. For me, the counseling wouldn't have stuck if I didn't have the medication to rationally hear and feel what I was discovering about my hurtful past. The medication wouldn't have worked alone because I never would have discovered what was triggering me in the first place. Like alcohol, prescribed medication use likely would have increased over time with no light at the end of the tunnel. With the help of medication and my counselor and no accountability, moving forward to the next season of my life, I would have likely stayed aware and comfortable with my victimization. Medication for now, counseling for the past, accountability for the future. Slowly over time, I began to feel better. And when I was asked to be interviewed by the Kansas City Star prior to the 2006 baseball season, I used my unique platform to share my struggles with anxiety and depression. At that time, there weren't many first person accounts of men talking about depression and anxiety and hardly anyone describing the sobbing sleepless nights. Most available resources were written by doctors describing the science behind depression and anxiety and self help gurus describing practical ways to pull oneself out of the pit of depression. But what gave me the most hope during my recovery was other people sharing their past battles with me and using those stories to encourage me to press on. Anyone who has suffered from severe anxiety and depression will tell you that the disease is the second worst part. The worst part is feeling alone, that nobody will understand or care, and that there is no hope for a better life. So what had become my biggest source of hope turned into my biggest contribution. In 2009, I used my platform 
as a public figure to write a book detailing my battle and survival from depression and anxiety. And what began as a misguided search for happiness through success and the admiration of strangers for what I did resulted in the joy of receiving countless letters from strangers thanking me for who I was. So I'm not here today to shed any new light on the roots of anxiety and depression or the latest medical and psychological advances. And I'm certainly not qualified to suggest how our legislative and judicial system should respond to this ongoing crisis in our country. I'm here to share and to encourage you. I wanna conclude with two important principles I've learned from Royals president of baseball operations, Dayton Moore, that has transformed the culture of our team, both on the field and in our community. Number one, all of our success is tied together. It is the belief of the Kansas City Royals that every member of the organization's success is important and that it's all tied together from the parking lot attendance all the way to the players on the field. If one of us does well, we all reap the benefits. And when somebody falls down, we all feel it. And the same goes for the important people in this room and watching online. I believe all of you gathered today have the opportunity to help the individual struggle with mental health and the responsibility to improve your state's mental health. That leads me to principle number two, you can't lead someone else until you lead yourself first. Victory and acceptance lectures that tell us we need to be united after months of character assassinations and mudslinging is a terrible and ineffective model of leadership. If I only had the privilege of hiring somebody else to say all the things that I didn't have the courage to say myself, except I'm Ryan Lefevre and I approve this message. All of our success is tied together and our collective mental health is tied together. I applaud you for gathering together I have no doubt that this group of esteemed men and women will do something that will have a ripple effect for years and years. But if you too are suffering from what I've suffered from, the next best step might be for you to work on yourself first before you attempt to work on somebody else. Maybe you, like me, have achieved everything or perhaps more than you had ever hoped for. And it doesn't look like or feel like you thought it would. If your world seems to be closing in on you and you're wondering if it's gonna get any better, I'm here to tell you that it can. And even better than that, you might be able to use your unique platform to take what's happened to you and use it to help somebody else. You all have authority by the stroke of the pen and you have tremendous power with words from your heart. All of the success in this room is tied together. What then could that look like if you choose to lead and heal yourself first before you lead and heal others? Thank you for inviting me to say a few words today. I applaud you for coming together and I'm praying for you for the sake of the mental health of future leaders in Kansas and other states that you will stay together. Thank you, Ryan Lefevre. What a great way to start our day.